Hi, this is Chuck Martin. I'm here at the AI Summit. With me today is Tyler Fulkman from Ben Group. Welcome. Yeah, thanks for having me. So Ben Group is Branded Entertainment Network. Um, I obviously know what it is. T tell the audience, what, what is the Ben Group? Yeah, what we really focus on is influencer marketing and product placement. So helping brands get their products in the content. So if you're watching a TV show or your favorite influencer on YouTube, you can really see it as you're engaging with the content and doing that in a way that's really impactful for audiences. So this is basically product placement in movies and TV shows. <laughs> yep. So when someone sees that Heineken or whatever in a James Bond movie or whatever, right. they, it's, it's you guys who put that in there. Yeah, we actually did James Bond. <laughs> uh, all the way back to Forrest Gump with Dr. Pepper. So were you doing that before AI? Yeah, so our history in product placement influencer marketing goes many decades back, along before we're talking about deep learning and unstructured data. But really within the last five years, we've really doubled down on AI and investing in technology. So your background is in seriously technology. Um, where, where does that fit in the grand scheme? Is that mm. something that it basically evolved to needing that at Ben Group or something that kind of was early on identified? Yeah, it definitely evolved. So as we've been in this space, we've noticed that there's really like a thousand Hollywoods now. So there's Instagram, there's YouTube, there's Hollywood, there's also the Netflix shows, the Amazon shows. People's eyeballs are spread so, th not thin, but so many different places that you need technology and data and insights to help you to navigate it, to understand it. Where, you know, 40 years ago, it was the major broadcast television shows. 7 p.m. was prime time, you wanted your ads there, and there wasn't really a lot of understanding that really needed to be had. Now, to be effective and agile and move quickly, you need to understand a lot of marketplaces, and data really helps with that. So tell me, take me through a scenario of getting a product placed in, it, say, a, a movie or a TV show. Yeah, for movie and TV, it, it is really a relationship with these people that we have where we can go to them early, understand what films are coming out, what shows they're working on. We can even read the scripts. We then work with our partners or any brands we might have in consideration. And so you're seeing movie scripts before the movie is done? Yeah. I mean, to get the products in, you got to know, you know where they're going to go. And so, so you never get to see the end of a movie since you know the ending <laughs> already. I personally don't see them, so I'm okay. I'm <laughs> safe. But a lot of the team does, yeah see what those are. Okay, so you see a script, and then, and then what? Then you really try to identify the best brands that can operate within that script, find the best interaction moments, the best opportunities for the audience to really engage, and then we can use the data to forecast how well we think that might do. So like we predict how well a new show will do on, say, Netflix before it even comes out. We take some information you'd have maybe a year in advance on like who's directing it, uh, what genre it is, all this information we can get, and we forecast and say, is this the next hit? Or is it going to be a flop? If it looks really promising, we'll then work with that company to try to get the right products in the right place. So if you can predict that a movie or, or say a Netflix show or anything is going to be a flop, why do they still do it? Yeah, I would say the predictions aren't always right. Right, we're trying to learn from data and sometimes you make mistakes. So there is learning that can happen from getting the model wrong. Um, and also, for us, success might be different than what success means for like a Netflix. Like for Netflix, it's going to be this ROI on like budget versus return. For us, it's more depending on the brand's need, is that going to be successful? Is it going to hit the right number of eyes, the right audience? So it might be successful for Netflix, but not for the brand, if that makes sense. So do you go to, you, you get all this data, and then you, do you go to a brand, like, like you must know all the brands by now, and they must all know you. Mm -hmm. So you go to them and say, we have a movie that's going to be a hit for you, let me show you why? Yep, that's definitely one way it happens. Um, some other ways, I mean really any way we can, but most common really is we know what's happening and we go to the brands. Um, but sometimes if there's other more organic opportunities, we'll bring it up. Uh, and then on the influencer side with like YouTube and Instagram, that's much more real time. So like with an influencer, they can make a new video any day of the week, right? It doesn't have such a long production process. So we can get brands into that content much more uh, fluidly. So if you, if you see a, an opportunity for say, say a soft drink or a hamburger or something, mm -hmm. and you've got Pepsi or Coke or McDonald's or Burger King, um, how do you decide which one to go to? Yeah, good question. I think for us it's going to be where our partnerships are. Generally when we partner, we're not necessarily competing. We don't partner with necessarily strongly competing brands all the time. Um, so probably if like, we're working with McDonald's, it would be obviously McDonald's. Um, McDonald's is here, by the way. Yeah, yeah, I, I think I heard their talk. Um, yeah, we just talked about the a little yeah, yeah. <laughs> So yeah, I think for us it's really just more where our partnerships lie. Um, and then sometimes it really is more obvious. Like Stranger Things had KFC, and KFC was a really strong fit because of the, the era of the show. 
So like sometimes there is a more obvious fit for a brand, even in the same space, depending on like the time frame. Coke was also big in Stranger Things because Coke was a really big deal back then. It still is, but even back then it had a really big brand presence. So do you see when, like, like a McDonald's for example, uh, they got a product placement in something, do you, do you measure that that moved the needle somehow? Yeah, we do. We, um, we actually have a team that looks at the quality of impression. So that could be like how much of the product was showing, where was it showing, did they talk about it, did they not talk about it, it was just in the background. And then we also track over time the impressions that that got. So like how many people ended up watching this content. So when you kind of take the quality plus the impressions, you get a sense of value for the brand. So how do you, you can Coke, uh, Coke or Pepsi or McDonald's or anybody, can they then track uh, performance of purchase or is it really just impression? Mm -hmm. Depends on the brand. So some brands have more sophisticated attribution and we can work with them on that. Uh, some brands it's really hard. They don't necessarily have the internal attribution process set up yet or maybe it's just actually quite hard for them. So retail stores tend to struggle more because you could wander six months later in because you saw the show. And then e-commerce stores are the easiest. So like the easiest direct path to sales is we work with the YouTuber, they put the link in their description and it goes straight to an e-commerce store and they buy the product. Very easy to track and understand the data. The hardest is more like a, a Coke in a movie where you're not expecting people to watch a movie with Coke in it and go buy a bunch of Coke right afterwards. It's more of like during the next period they might be buying more Coke. So you're looking more for lift over time and seeing some of those fluctuations. Um, you mentioned the uh, James Bond move. Can you, can you tell me what happened there? How you got a product in there? Yeah, I don't actually personally have a lot of the history, but I do know a couple things. We did help move him into BMW. So that was us working with the brand. And then also, um, he changed his drink. I think it's a Heineken. And so we also yes. worked there, yeah. So those are two brands we were working with and we saw an opportunity. We did the same thing with Transformers. So we're working with that to make it a certain car brand versus another one. Um, so yeah, there is real power, I think, for brands to change the messaging around their brand based on product placement. Like, being the car that James Bond drives has a certain coolness factor with it. Oh, that's, that's a big deal. Yeah, it's a big deal. So you're here at the summit. What are you, what are you expecting to see here? Or what yeah. have you seen so far, even? Yeah, I think for me, I've been really impressed with seeing what some people are doing with AI. Um, we were listening to some text-to-speech, uh, which was really cool, or speech-to-text the other way. So some pretty impressive technology there on really taking voice in real time and transcribing it effectively. Um, there's been some cool stuff on carbon footprints that I think is very interesting to be thinking about, like how much does AI impact the environment? How can better track and measure that and be more aware? Um, and then for us, we talked about deployment, which I think has been a theme as well, is like, how do you take this value and get it out to production? And you're on the program here. Yeah. So what are you going to be talking about? Yeah, we did, we talked tomorrow actually a bit about entertainment and AI. So if you're in the marketing space and interested in entertainment, it's going to be really valuable in how AI operates there. And then today, about an hour ago, we talked about how to effectively deploy your machine learning. So if you have a team that's really struggling to get their value out to your customers, um, we've been working on this for a while on how to really effectively get that out and make value happen for machine learning. And you're a member of, and Ricky Ray, your CEO, is a member of Visionaires. Yep. We, we always love seeing you on the round tables. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's great. Uh, so a year from now, we're sitting here having a conversation. Mm -hmm. What will we be talking about? The same thing or something different? Yeah, it's a good question. I think in AI specifically, a year from now, I think we'll continue to talk a lot about uh, environmental impact. I think with the way bigger models are going and how it's impacting the environment is a real concern. I also think we'll be talking more about small data. So like how do we create value when you don't have enormous Google-sized data sets or maybe Google-sized compute? And I think that's really more interesting for a lot of companies. Because if you're a local e-commerce store, you're not sitting on billions of transactions every day that you can really farm. You might be sitting on 10 transactions a day or hundreds. And how do you effectively use that? And then I think also uh, bias and fairness is going to continue to be a trend where how do we really understand the impact of these models on different groups of people, um, especially if you're operating within like finance where this is really applicable or any type of like consumer good product. Like if you are modeling something, you might be biasing things in a way you don't understand. And we're kind of getting at the level with AI now where the predictions are getting pretty good but we're finding sometimes we're not predicting the things we wanted to. Uh, and so better understanding there I think will be really helpful. Well, I look forward to the conversation next year and good luck with the summit. Yeah, I really appreciate it. Thanks for the time. Thank you. Yeah.